You're listening to the Reconditioned Podcast. And today I speak to brain optimization expert, Dr. Rimka, who counters the argument in last week's episode with the idea that all humans need animal protein in their diet. It's controversial and it's heated. So stay tuned for all the good stuff. Your personality creates your personal reality. Authentic power is when your personality comes to serve the energy of your soul. The truth is the body is one ecosystem. You can get to the root cause and everything goes away. Welcome to the Reconditioned Podcast, where I use my knowledge and expertise of over a decade in the wellness and transformation world to take a deep dive into what makes us thrive as humans. I'm Lauren Vaknin, leading wellness and transformation coach. And following my remission from the rheumatoid arthritis I'd had for 27 years that left me wheelchair bound by the age of 18, I created a unique coaching combination, conflating physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual aspects of self to create true long lasting well-being in all senses of the word. This podcast is one of the many free resources I've created to help you achieve the same. Whether you're suffering from chronic illness, raising children in a world of conflicting information, you're an entrepreneur wanting to step into your purpose, or you simply want to feel empowered and motivated to become the best version of yourself, join me along with expert guests as we uncover the most actionable and tangible ways to recondition ourselves back to wellness. The Recondition Your Life Academy is going to be open for enrollment again from the 24th of August for a few short days. It only opens three times a year and there are limited spaces because I keep these groups intimate. And of course, it's first come, first served. You can head to laurenvacneencoaching.com and go to the client love page to see what Academy alumni are saying about how the course changed their lives. From helping to find their purpose to finally recovering from trauma to finally being able to manifest their dream relationship after being single for years, to understanding their body better in order to recover from illness, to, well, just actually being happy for the first time. If you are not in complete alignment in your life, if you've read all the self-help books, you've taken all the courses, you're listening to all the motivational speakers, but nothing is shifting for you, and you are just so ready to be happy and fulfilled already, If you're ready to become your best self and start manifesting into your life everything you dream of, the Recondition Your Life Academy is for you. It's a 12-week remote course where you are coached by me personally and alongside a sacred tribe of like-minded women, all there to up-level their lives. We work through the four aspects of self, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, tackling every aspect of self that could be broken until we heal the whole person. It is unique. You will not find anything else out there like it. And it changes lives every single time. Just check out all the video testimonials on my Instagram highlights to see what I mean. The transformations as a result of this course have been life changing. And you could have that too. And I want you to have that too. So get a guaranteed spot by getting your name on the waiting list over at laurenvacneencoaching.com forward slash recondition and put the steps in place to recondition your life today. Well, boy, do I have an episode for you today. <laughs> Whew, it has been a hectic week. I've recorded these two episodes, this series of which is healthier, a plant-based diet or an omnivore diet, a meat-based animal protein diet, whatever you want to call it. I don't, I'm doing episodes on this. I don't even have the right terminology for it because Dr. Rimka, who is who I interviewed in this episode today, isn't even about being an omnivore. It's about being literally just eating meat. So firstly, apologies, not in the episode, but for this intro, my window is wide open in case there is any background noise because it is sweltering. It's really hot in my office. So the window is open. So I apologize for that. 
Okay, so if you haven't listened to last week's episode with Dr. Badger Curl, please go back and do that and listen to the intro in that episode because I prefaced that. As I said in that episode, there are things I didn't agree with, but I'm not into censorship. So instead, I just do an intro to let you all know about the things I don't agree with because, you know, you guys are kind of listening to these episodes and a lot of you are long term loyal followers listening to every episode, which I so appreciate, by the way. And, you know, there are often things that will be said that you guys will get back to me and say, yeah, I did this, I implemented this. So if it's something I don't agree with, I feel a duty to let you know where I'm coming from and you guys can make up your own minds. But if it's something about health that I feel I've done a lot of research on and doesn't sit right with me, I feel the need to say that, which I did in the last episode. This particular episode with Dr. Rimka, nothing in terms of stuff that I have been researching for years in science and things I vehemently disagree with at all. Just things that I thought were just just didn't sit well with me necessarily, like really eating all meat and hardly any plants at all. I love Dr. Rimka. <laughs> I think she's great. She's hilarious. She's a real character and I just get on really well with her. And she's living a very specific kind of life, but then so am I. So who am I to judge? So I wanted to kind of do this intro to give my conclusion on at the end of doing these two episodes they really drained me. It took a lot of energy out of me, I've got to say, doing these two episodes because it took a lot of research. There was a lot of heated debate and controversy and stuff that I don't get so much of that. When I interview people, it's usually people who I want to interview and we kind of talk about the things we we all agree with. But you know, that's what makes it interesting, right? So instead of censoring it, I'm just doing this and you guys can come up with your own conclusions. But essentially, I do believe that humans need plants. I do believe in eat the rainbow. I do believe that there are lots of nutrients in plants that we need, vitamins and nutrients are essential. So in that side of it, I'm not sure that I personally agree with Dr. Rimka. From my kind of coming up to two decades of research in the natural health world, it always came back to me that it was an individualized approach was what worked. In my own journey, in my clients' journeys, generally in life, you know, you look at your genetics, read up on your own genetics, get a genetic workup, look at your bloods. What does your body respond to? Even if it's not to do a test, what does your body respond to and not respond to? You know, because I mean, Dr. Rimka said something interesting, which was that her small little dog, I can't remember the breed, she said, let's just go with like a Maltese. My tiny Maltese is more similar to a huge Mastiff than it is to a cat the same size as it in terms of the species. And we need to eat species appropriate diets. And so she believes that species appropriate diet for humans is meat, wherever you're coming from. So based on my own journey of just kind of this being such a journey for me, being vegetarian for ethical reasons, really feeling strongly about being being vegetarian for ethical reasons. And then no matter what I try with every practitioner from my homeopath to my functional medicine doctor to my acupuncturist to my shaman, being led back to meat, and then my genetics and my blood workups all saying the same. I've had to succumb to the fact that my body actually needs this and I feel better on it. So I get very good quality, organic, pasture-reared, grass-fed meat from a local farm that I source myself and I won't eat meat anywhere else unless I've sourced it. Or if it's someone like me, whose house I'm going to and I I know that I can trust them. Obviously, the ethical side of it is still there for me. Although, as we heard with Dr. Bajikal last week saying about uh, eating non-organic soya and Dr. Rimka talking about how rainforests are being chopped down to grow GMO soya. So, you know, there is really nuance in this, guys. And I think we can tend to look at one side. But what I wanted to do here was, is one really healthier than the other? You know, let's put the ethics aside for a moment. Not because we should put ethics aside, because it's a huge point, but just in order to get to the bottom of this argument, which is hard to do if the ethics side of it is there, put the ethics aside just to see, is one or other really healthier? And my conclusion from doing these two episodes and then sitting with it for a few days before recording these intros is that I don't think so. I think there's nuance to it. And I think it's an individualized approach. And that is my personal conclusion. Other people will come up with their own conclusions. I might get a lot of backlash from the vegan community here. This isn't to offend anyone. And I have lots of vegan friends. Much love to you all. This is just my journey and what I have come to after many years of working on my health. I'm very conscious about everything that goes in my body. So balance that against, you know, eating vegan burgers that are processed and I don't know, you know, whatever, like everything that goes in my body is a whole food down to what I cook my food on that they're non toxic pans. I'm conscious about everything that goes on in my body. So I think that there's something to be said for that as well. And I think there's something to be said also for having an emotion around food. So if you truly believe 
and there is a real, you know, hurt in you at the thought of eating meat, you will ingest that energy as you're eating and then meat might not be healthy for you, even if, you know, there is some scientific evidence to show that we benefit from some small amounts of organic animal protein. So like I said, lots of nuance to it. It's not black and white. That's my conclusion that it's an individualized approach. By that, I don't mean, oh, well, I like eating meat, so I'm just going to eat meat all day, every day, or I'm going to go out and buy whatever meat. No, be conscious about the meat you're eating if you're eating meat. If you are eating animals, be conscious about that and do that in the most humane, most conscious way that is possible to do that. So equally, if you are eating plants and you are not eating meat, maybe have some empathy for people who feel that their bodies need meat for whatever reason. You know, in the way that I do, it has not been an easy journey. I'm not just like, oh yeah, I like meat. It's not like that at all. It's having been on and off vegetarian for so long and for whatever reason being needed to be led back to meat each time. And so that's where I'm at. So I just wanted to preface all that so that you know where I'm at with all of this. It gets heated, it gets controversial, it's interesting. I'm intrigued to know what you think of it. So just, you know, let's start the conversation over on my socials at Lauren Vacneen on Instagram and recondition your life with Lauren Vacneen on Facebook because I'd love to know what you guys think of this. And if you do want to debate me a bit on this, that's absolutely fine as well. Let's start that conversation. So without further ado, let's get on with the second part in this two-part series with Dr. Rimka. Dr. Stephanie Rimka is an award-winning holistic brain optimization specialist focusing on integrated neurotherapies to identify and address the root cause of mental illness, learning disorders, and chronic illness. She's dedicated over 25 years to learning the best practices in functional medicine from masters in their fields. Dr. Rimka is active in private practice, seeing clients one-to-one, teaching online group courses in her e-learning center, leading healing group retreats internationally, teaching continuing education certifications to GA doctors, advising on a scientific advisory board, and most importantly, raising her teenage son, Bennett. So thank you, Dr. Rimka, for being here today. It's awesome to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, you're so welcome. Well, we've already had like quite a chat. So we'll just kind of go back to all the things that we've already spoken about that that I don't want to miss, that I didn't want to miss in actual recording. But before we get into that, I always start the show by asking the guest, what have you done so far today to support your wellness? Oh, that's an awesome question. Today is an odd day as I told you before, because I've been up since 1.30, which I'm normally awake between 4.30 and 5.30. So because I was awake, and I think it's the energetic solar eclipse, we happen to be June 10th, and there's going to be a, a solar eclipse, and there's a lot of galactic energies that come in, and we are affected by these things. So I think I was just a little bit like that. But so far today, I have... I'm on a meditation pause. So I normally would have said I meditated, but I'm taking a break. That's Interesting. A Can you explain that? Uh, just sometimes I have a voice that tells me to stop. Right. Um, I've been doing it 25 years and I just think there's sometimes, and it could be even my own, it could be my ego voice that's actually afraid of going deeper. I don't know, but I've been leading a group course for women called M2. It's my master's course. And it was a four month or so long experiential course of shamanic. I did it on an online format of Zoom, right? And which was different to try this experiment. And it was all like, about dropping into the heart and dealing with disembodied spirits and entities and rebirthing. And I was doing, it was a very intense kind of four months. Mm. And I think that ended about two months ago, two and a half months ago. And I think my system just needed a break, right? From going deep into my own inner self for a minute, because I was doing it so much for so many people and, and reformatting grids and just doing a lot in, in the ethers, right? So I think that's why. So that being said, um, I have done affirmations. I have, um, I read a book, (laughs) I read a book on spirituality consciousness related to the Emerald tablets. Um, I did red light therapy. Um, I've had a few different supplements that are accessing, putting me into ketosis instantly. Um, I've taken suet. So I've taken fat, more fat to get, is that drive my body into ketosis, help my mitochondria. I've taken a mitochondrial support. Uh, I've had collagen. And mostly I've just kind of chilled with that information that was like positive flooding thing that things that are hopefully vibrating higher and protecting me throughout the day. I've had a great conversation with a friend that is an energy worker. And just through that, she actually checked out my throat chakra, my heart chakra, and she saw some energy and she's pulling some things off of me. So I've contracted her to work on me all day. So there's that. Um, She's doing that from Canada. And... Let me think what else I haven't done. Normally I would be in the sauna right now. I have a, I'd be in the sauna and then I would 
lift and use a vibration plate. But, but I'm a little bit, you know, we're doing an early morning thing. So yeah, do- I was going to say that's a lot for nine o'clock in the morning. So that's amazing. Um, it, it's really efficient. You can get stuff done. So I haven't visualized yet. I haven't meditated, but I, again, meditation break. Amazing. Okay. Well, that's, yeah, so much already for nine o'clock. So that's um, a lot, a lot to be. None of that's hard. That's all easy. Yeah, no, I, it's all about getting into the routine. It's just, it's filled me up. It's not hard. Once you learn to do a new thing, you make it a new behavior. And I, I don't believe it takes 30 days, it takes about 90 days. Um, then it's like, it's just a part of what I do. Yeah. And we're going to get into what you do and I'm really excited to dive in. So, um, as you know, last week I interviewed a doctor who advocates a plant-based diet, uh, for health and, um, You've got a lot to teach us about all your methods and brain optimization and all of that. But, and I do want to go into that, but before we do, I do want to take the time with you specifically because you are an expert in this to counter last week's argument because you advocate eating organic animal protein for health. And it's important for me to do these episodes back to back with each kind of expert stating their case. And the reason I'm doing it is because there's just so much conflicting advice and that's out there about what really is the healthier option. There's a lot of people advocating keto, paleo, stuff like that. And then equally, you know, kind of the vegan community is really big now um, and and really well heard. And obviously from an ethical perspective, we understand that. Um, And just to preface, like I did last week, I am coming from a completely unbiased place with this because I used to be vegetarian uh, for ethical reasons for a long time. And for ethical reasons, I still would like to be, but my health, some reason somehow always takes me back to animal produce and every practitioner from my homeopath my functional medicine doctor my midwife when I was pregnant and my iron was low and now the South American shaman I'm working with have all every time put me back on meat and at the end of my pregnancy with my daughter my iron was super low and nothing was working and my homeopath was like Lauren you need to eat a steak and I just always joke and I think I said this in last week's episode it was like when Popeye eats the spinach and his muscles just like pop up. That was what it was like for me when I ate the meat. Like I could feel the color coming back to myself. My iron did go up and I had assumed that I would go back to being vegetarian after I had the baby. And then all this stuff happened and now I'm not. So um, like with all things with healthcare, I believe so much is requires an individualized approach. And I wonder if that is your view on it. Uh, yeah, sure. To an extent, um, individualized approach, right? So I had a whole, I've changed my website a lot, but I had whole pages about biochemical individuality. Uh, I deal with genetics and looking at um, the influence around lifestyle behaviors that can turn on and off genes and, and tell them, direct them what to do, because they're just, a, they're just a blueprint. They're not, they mean really nothing unless you do something with it. Right. Okay. Um, so biochemical individuality is real. But to a point, I think actually sometimes it gets said so much. At the end of the day, we're all human beings. We're homo sapiens sapien. And just like uh, there's, I have a dog. I have a pet dog, right? He's only a 19 pound Yorkie poo, but he's still a dog. He's more similar to a 200 pound mastiff than he is to a cat, right? Because they're in the same species. They're different sizes, a little bit different breed, a little bit different whatever. But at the end of the day, even though my dog's gastrointestinal tract is smaller than the Mastiff's, it's really exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So they need the same basic way of eating because they're the same species. They have different colors. They have different kind of skin, different, you know, fur texture, but it's the same basic thing. So we have some nuances, whether we come from equatorial African countries, or we're from Siberia or Nordic, right? Because we all look a little bit different in East Asian. If an alien flew down here and landed in China, and then they flew over to India, and then they flew over to Sweden, they might think they're on different planets. Mm-hmm. Because the people do look pretty different, actually, right? Mm-hmm. Kind of like a mastiff and a bulldog and a chihuahua look very different. Yet we know they're the same thing. All right. So let me just say that we're human. If you are of the species Homo sapien, where we are today, there aren't that many differences, to be honest. And I think sometimes we keep using this diff. Oh, we're all so different. And no, we're not. 
We're not. We have the same emotional needs, psychological needs, and same food and dietary needs for the most part. You have a few, you know, we all have about 100,000 SNPs in us, which are what we would say mutations, 100,000, right? Those variants might mean you might need three times more zinc than I need, but I still need a certain amount of zinc, Mm -hmm. right? You might need a lot more B3 and B6 than me because of these uh, ethnic variations, but you know, that that's usually handled in the local environment. So that being said, I don't think we're as different as people want to keep always saying we're different. Mm. There is a proper human diet that humans are supposed to eat, just like there's a proper dog diet, just like there's a proper lion diet, just like there's a proper cow diet. And if you deviate from that, you get sick. And every species has a species appropriate diet. And the further you get away from what nature designed the species to eat, you start getting sick. That's it. I've never heard anyone describe it like that. It's a really interesting explanation. So, so okay, so here's the question, and here's the question that everyone is always hoping for the answer for. Were we really designed to eat meat or were we designed to eat plants? Because the Western A. Price, you know, ancient traditions, uh, a nourishing traditions camp will say we have always eaten meat, we were created to eat meat. And the plant-based camp will say, no, we were eating plants way before we were eating meat. What were we designed for as homo sapiens? Uh, The anthropological evidence is very clear. There is no getting around it. I was a vegetarian for 14 years, 12 of which I was a vegan. There is tremendous misinformation, myths and lies that perpetuate the scientific literature, ranging from the cholesterol studies of Ansel Keys to all kinds of nonsense that has come down. So you've got to really look behind, well, what does the study say? If you just look to nature and you look to what we've discovered about what actually is, so you can go backwards and look at anthropology and the anthropological evidence is overwhelmingly clear. And this is what I could not deny any longer as a vegetarian, overwhelmingly animal-based. We absolutely, the further back you go, the more animal-based it is. 90 to 100% of in old people 100,000 years ago and longer, they, they ate nothing but animals. That's what they ate. And then you can look at uh, G, um, uh, geographical information and understanding the weather and what the earth looked like. Because it didn't look like this 11,000 years ago. It didn't look like this 40,000 years ago. We've had different ice ages and you look at what the planet was really like and the availability of plants. And it's absolutely insane that anybody would consider that that's how humans were living. It wasn't even around, you know? So if you go to Alaska or you go to Siberia, look at how those people are living. What are they eating? 90 to 100% animal-based because there are no plants growing in the tundra. You know what I mean? It's, it's not there. They never need it, and yet they're never deficient in anything. They're never sick with anything. There's no heart disease. There's no cancer. There's no diabetes. They live long. There's no brittle bones. There's no sarcopenia. Hmm. There's no obesity. Hmm. Okay. Like So there's that piece of information that you cannot get away from. Then if you just come to today and you look at any culture of homo sapien human beings living in nature, without technology, without electricity, without grocery stores and refrigerators, what are they all doing? They're all predominantly animal-based. 75 to 100% of their diets are based on nose to tail eating an animal. Every single one of them. There is no natural vegetarian or vegan society ever in the history of of the world. It's all been created because of religion. Period. The data is, if they don't want to believe that, they're delusional and choosing to see, the cognitive dissonance is so strong, their bias won't allow them to see something, which I totally understand. Cognitive dissonance and bias against information is so strong. I've actually had situations, and I have deep compassion because I understand it now, where a child will tell their mother, daddy is raping me. That mother cannot believe that to be true so strongly because Mm. of what that might mean. She won't believe the child and she'll believe the father and the child will be, will get in trouble. This happens every day. I knew of situations like that when I was in high school, 
friends of mine went through this. So if you know the human mind is that strong to deny a fat like that, mm. imagine what it can do to justify eating the way you want to eat, living the way you want to live. But the truth is the truth, whether or not you want to see it or not. Does, does that make sense? Absolute sense based on things that are true to me that the main, you know, people in the mainstream do not agree with and, 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 you know, mainstream media is telling us something completely different and things in my lifestyle that I follow and, and believe wholeheartedly to with every fiber of my being are true. Um, what I do want to ask though, is how do we, if this is the case, how do we manage it ethically? How do we, because the, the, the planet is struggling based on how much, based on the meat consumption and factory farming. And, you know, I, I'm guessing that you are advocating organic pasture reared grass fed meat. Um, I could be wrong, but I am guessing that you are kind of, you know, on that health um, side of things. How do we manage it in terms of the planet and how can we continue to sustain the planet? the way it's going with how meat is being reared. Okay, so one, you just said misinformation, right? So you believe the propaganda that the earth is suffering from eating meat. It is not. That's a lie. I believed it too. So right there, you have to, we have to really question, why do you believe that? What, where's the data supporting that? Well, I'm, cause I'm gonna, I'm gonna interrupt you because it, I have seen animals kept in dire conditions and those yeah. animals should oh, right so, so that is that's suffering that, that, that's not the same as the planet can't sustain it environmentally that's not the same thing suffering, right two separate things okay yeah, two separate that's not things the same thing we have to see so you can't conflate that information not the same thing so farming in any sort is not the thing destroying the planet and that's the lie we keep wanting to tell ourselves to justify our addiction to comfort and technology. You want to change what the planet looks like? Stop your addictions to technology. Stop your addictions to central heat and air. Stop your addictions to gasoline and fracking and everything else and flying in planes. Stop traveling. Right? We've seen what has happened in the last 18 months by the, by the decrease in traveling and planes and jets and cars and everybody having me stuck and quarantined and locked down. And I'm not advocating for any of that, but there's been a massive explosion in regrowth and in, in places in the world. There's been a massive change in the particulate matter in the air, the pollution, you know, huge change just because of the behaviors we choose. The actual contribution of what Farm, farming does is about 1% of the environmental impact compared to what the manufacturing, you know, what the kind of how many factories, how many chemicals, how many trucks, how many, how much gas, petrol, ships, freight trains, jets, it takes to get a fake burger in a, in a thousand grocery stores. It takes a lot. I eat roughly a cow a year. One cow sustains my life all year long. Mm. Please tell me how that, and I can get it right here, 50 miles from my house, from a farmer. I can buy a whole cow, put it in my freezer, wrapped in paper, no plastic. It's only the gas to my car to go get it. Okay, so let's, let's be real clear on, on that. These are not the same thing. And then in addition, the most potent sequestr sequestration um, thing that, that we have on earth is the soil. The soil takes the carbon dioxide and all the other gases in the air and helps recycle them, right? And what does that? Animals that walk across it, trampling their feet, pooping on it, creating an incredible environment in the soil and in the grass for the snakes and the rats and the bugs and the rabbits and the squirrels and everybody lives in wonderful harmony eating each other. That's what's actually going on when you eat this way as a human. Humans had no problem. The earth was not struggling when, when people were following a bunch of cattle around and killing mammoths and everything else. Not a, not a thing <laughs> where, we, where there was the earth struggling. She could breathe just fine, okay? It's very, very different to say these two things are the same. Now, you know, take, uh, the, it comes down to living connected to nature. 
Mm. Having a bunch of animals packed in disgusting environments, not allowed to walk on grass, be in sun, you know, eat what they're supposed to eat, a species appropriate diet, uh, having, to, you know, like, I mean, that's, that's the sickness I said. I said, when you start making things far away from nature, everything gets sick. So of course, the planet's getting sick from that. Monocrop uh, farming is doing that, you know, cutting down an entire forest to plant corn, to plant soy, that's what's happening in the Amazon. They're not cutting it down for beef. They're cutting it down for soy. And the lie that keeps getting told in the media is telling you something else to keep, distract you and keep having you buy your canola oil and your soybean oil and your fast food products that are using all that crap. That's destroying the planet, but it's making them a ton of money. So these aren't the same things. Now, suffering and cruelty and all of that, that's where you have your ethical issue. Nobody wants that. But I had a moment in Brazil, and this will always stick with me, and it changed my life when I was on a mission trip there as a vegetarian, and people were feeding us. The, they're missionaries. We were there for 10, 12 days, something like that, doctors. It was a 20, group of 21 doctors serving you know, people. It was in an incredibly poor area. We're going in, and you know, I would see two, 300 patients a day. It was just, we were like machines, 12, 13 hours on our feet, and a family would host us for lunch, okay? We were in a church. And you know, the first meal you would see, you come in and I'm talking poor, you know, poor in ways, poverty, you know, third world nations, the level of discrepancy. And, you know, we're coming in looking at this, like I was a group of four doctors in my pod where we were and we eyes big looking at each other. Like, I, I mean, I don't want to eat. Is this all their food? Like, I mean, I don't like, this is like a feast. It looked like Thanksgiving, you know, or Christmas for us. And they were so poor. We were, it was like a, you know, 10 people living in like two rooms. I, I, we felt guilty. We didn't know what to do. Then we also, you see, it's a, it, there's meat. There's a bunch of meat and stuff. And one of the docs, Jody, just said at the table, you know, in English, right? We had a translator of Portuguese and stuff. And she goes, so um, how many other vegetarians are at the table? And the other doctor, Skylar, goes, well, I'm not today. And I said, yep, me either. Right. So of the four of us, three of us were vegetarians. And this was 20 years ago. And we were like, oh boy. And I remember I asked for a minute, you know, because I was very sensitive. I didn't wear leather belts, leather shoes. I was very, very intense. My whole wedding was catered vegan. Two restaurants brought it in out of state. And I was very intense. And I started, I went to the bathroom to like wash my hands. And I mean, I was tearing up and I like prayed, like, what am I supposed to do? right? Like I'm so committed, like what, you know, and I realized it became very clear. This isn't about you. I was just shown a vision of a lion taking down a gazelle. I'm like, do you judge the lion? I was like, absolutely not. It's doing what it was born to do. And it's like, and so are you. And that was it. And I went and ate. I ate beyond people thought I'd be sick. I felt the best I ever felt on that trip. 10 days in Brazil, people, every people drop doctors were dropping left and right. I felt amazing. I was, I was going, I was actually the only student allowed to go with 20 practicing doctors. So I wasn't even used to seeing this many patients, right? I was very new. And I, it's one of those moments I, I came back and I still became a vegetarian. I still kept doing what I was doing. But every time I went on a mission trip, Brazil, Mexico, Costa Rica, I would eat meat and I would feel amazing because I'm like, well, they're giving it to me. I mean, I went, and I went full hog, ice cream, like screw it. <laughs> I'm gonna eat everything. You know? um, <laughs> And the nuns would make all my ice cream. I'm like, how can I say no? You know, you just always said thank you and, and be grateful. So, but it took me still, I was very resistant. So my cognitive dissonance still didn't want that to be true. Right. So that's, that's the reality of, of it's very, very different. I'm like, I don't judge them for it. So I had to start going, why are we putting so much judgment and shame on ourselves with being who we are? When did we get tricked into being human and living like a human was a shameful, horrible thing? Like, why is it shameful to show your breasts? Why is it shameful to see naked people? Because, you know, I remember, I don't know how old you are, but National Geographic, those magazines and women with their little spears and all their little, their get up, you know, there's all kinds of body parts exposed. People were, people are having babies in a hut with babies walking around. I mean, no one's ashamed of the body. And we've, we've, we've altered um, and brought a lot of shame and covering and, and decided things were dirty that were natural. 
And you really have to start going back. So, wow, what kind of games were played on me? What did I believe that these books were telling me about where I came from and who I am? So I, I really understand now by studying uh, tribes that I consider sacred, by looking at the Native American, the Aborigines, um, different uh, Peruvian, you know, shamanistic and cultures in Mexico. And I've been to these sites of Chichen Itza and pyramids and stuff. And when you really delve into it and you look at it, you're like, well, they all did it. And then, you know what I mean? And, and understanding and getting connected to it, I really can understand the circle of life now, the transmutation of energy. Everything is giving life to take care of life. And then we have these amazing bugs of bacteria and fungi and stuff that clean up all the dead for us and put it right back into the earth so it can all be full of, so look, I'm, my minerals, my body is going to have to go right back into the earth and replenish it so the cow can eat, the, the, the grass is, has good topsoil so the cow can eat it so somebody else can eat the cow. You know what I mean? So the, 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 you know, the gazelle eats the grass so like the lion can eat it, you know, and nobody takes what they don't need in excess. That is a natural order of things. Going away from nature and going to factories and factory farming and manufactured pro products that go in boxes and cans and, and plastic, that always leads to overconsumption. That is the burden on the earth, right? So of course I want people to support local farmers and especially ones who are trying regenerative farming. It is incredibly expensive for that farmer. There's very low profit in meat. Uh, there's incredible profit in seed oils and grains. I mean, the profit on a box of cereal is insane. We all understand the profit on alcohol is insane. You know, it's pennies to make the stuff and you can charge whatever you want. Cereal is the same way. You can't charge high profit on meat. It, it comes out of the reach of people. So and that's, the, that's the lie people are trying to say like, ooh, big beef is they're, like everybody, all these farmers are so wealthy. Um, no, it's not how it works go to a local farmer and, and see if they've got Bentleys and yachts in their driveway. They don't, but the owners and, and the profit holders of Beyond Burger do, they sure do. They're driving Bentleys and Ferraris and have yachts. So, so it is about, and then you are advocating kind of a local organic farming, like you say, regenerative farming, and that's the way you forward. Even. The term organic is actually, you know, that's a, it's a corporate term. Most farmers can't afford the fees to become certified and organic. Right. Yeah. You've got, and that's the thing. We, we use a farmer who doesn't have the certified, he doesn't pay for the certified uh, stamp. Um, but we know that the, the, the meat is organic in terms of, I mean, he even regenerated the soil that his land is on right. in order to make sure that what the cows were eating and the animals were eating was like pure grass, you know, totally, you know, with all the minerals it needs, not this kind of, and he, he actually said that what he had realized was after the war, <clears throat> the second world war, so much, so many of the bombs and, and kind of everything that was in the air after that had really damaged the soil. So he, in his land, he totally regenerated the source. So for me, and, and, you know, the cows are outside and they're roaming and the chickens are roaming and everything. That's organic farming. That's what I mean by organic. So I get, I, Natural. It's really yeah. just nature. I mean, and his soil, I guarantee you, isn't what it was 100 years ago, no yeah. matter what it did. Because mm -hmm. there's glyphosate everywhere. I mean, it's on the majority of the planets in the air. Mm -hmm. So even when you, people are thinking, oh, it's organic, you're still mm -hmm. getting pesticides and poisons, you guys. It's in the rain. So it's always best to go as far away from that as you possibly can. And any farmer who knows what they're doing knows they're better off without chemicals and killing everything. You, if you're not doing that. You, that's what, glyphosate is designed to kill life in the soil. That's its job, right? So then they have to use fake seeds and genetic modification to try and make it grow. Then they have to put all this extra stuff in there to make it grow because you've killed everything. So that's what people are eating when they eat plant-based, by the way. It's all genetically modified. It's all poisoned. Well, what if they're buying organic plants, organic matter. fruits and vegetables? Because it's coming from seeds that have been altered. What you get in a store today, that stuff is not ever seen in nature. What a blueberry, a grape, a banana, a lettuce looks like in a store, that's all been created artificially to look pretty, change colors, and add sugar content. None of those things are wild. None of those things were somebody eating 10,000 years ago. They're a completely different thing. That's the, that's the facts and the lies that people don't know. 
They think, oh, but it's growing. It's natural. No, it's not. That banana doesn't look it up. Start going to a search engine like DuckDuckGo and say, you know, wild primal fruit and look at what they look like and look at the sugar content. Compare a watermelon from 5,000 years ago to a watermelon today. They don't look, taste anything the same. So what content of, of plants do you eat? So how, when, your diet specifically for you, what is, do you eat, how much, how much vegetables and fruits are you eating? I mean, is that really relevant? What I eat, right? Because me doesn't make any difference for anybody else. I'm interested in terms of the, 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 the kind of the amount of meat you're eating. Um, it's kind of like what's on your plate, you know, like, do you, are you still eating? So what I eat, like for people who are interested. In well, I get it. People are interested. I kind of hate the question because what I eat or what supplements I take doesn't matter. I don't know if you're pregnant, if you have RA, if you have chronic fatigue, if you're a, a male, if you're 17, you're six, you know, you're 66. It's going to be a little bit different. I'm a 48 year old ovulating woman who's not pregnant, not breastfeeding. Right. So again, it's an individualized approach, you're saying. To a, to a degree, right? This is what it comes down to. The proper human diet is animal-based, nose to tail, eating seasonally right close to you, right? So if you just follow nature, what I keep saying, you follow nature and what's available to you, you don't have a lot of plants available most of the year. If it's growing in a greenhouse, you shouldn't be eating it. If it's hydroponic, you shouldn't be eating. Those are stressed out plants, by the way. You talk about suffering, hydroponic tomatoes are suffering. That's not normal. None of that is normal. So plants feel, plants have pain and to act like they don't, this has been proven. So people are living in delusions, like something with a brain is the only thing that has feelings and can feel pain. So does the broccoli, so does the tomato, so does the asparagus. You are causing pain every time you eat something if you're going to really go down that rabbit hole. It's been absolutely shown in studies. They act, plants like people or don't like people. They, 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 they are very preferential in how they're treated and what they go through. This is, this is fact. It's proven. Just because they don't talk about it on the news doesn't mean it's not real. So if you look at it like that, there's not that much available. And let's put ourselves in nature. And I'll tell you what I eat in a second. Let's put ourselves in nature. If you're out living, and I'm not in a box with electricity and lights in a grocery store and UPS delivering me frozen food from Alaska, right? Um, I've got to compete with a lot of other things in nature to find a bunch of plants. And I live in a, like a, you know, little suburban area. I mean, I'm on, on about an acre, but there's houses all over me and people make gardens, right? They have their little gardens. And they're trying to go tomatoes and cucumbers and whatever. And there is constant complaining in our neighborhood, like next door, or Facebook or whatever our groups are. People are, I mean, I'm sure you've seen it. People are always complaining about the deer and the bunnies and everybody stealing all their food. And they've got a little garden and they've got nets around it and they've got a house and like they're in a really safe sequestered, not in the wild, really competing. And they can't even grow cucumbers and tomatoes and carrots because the, the rabbits and the squirrels and the deer get them. Now, imagine we were actually living in the wild. You know what I mean? And we really had things like, you know, gazelles and wild boars and all kinds of creatures to compete with. And we lived in a tribe which is what we all do in about 150 to 200 person pack is like the optimal zone and what it seems like that's what people end up doing to really be successful as a culture before cities and all that kind of, of living. Now you got 150 people and you come across a, a, so a bunch of apple trees, but you're competing with all those other animals. How many apples do you think are gonna be left that you can get that the animals aren't gonna kill you for? And then you got 150 people to share them with. So like you need context. Like that's what people seem to be forgetting. They think it's normal to open a refrigerator and just see food all the time. That's not how we lived. So what do I eat? I've been carnivore, which is like all animal-based for over three years. So I did it as like a 30 day experiment and I just really liked it because it's easy. So I would say for the last two years, I eat no plants. I mean, coffee. Let me say that. So I do do coffee, 
um, an occasional alcohol wine, right? So those are my plant sources. I use a little bit of spices and herbs. I use plants as medicine. Like I take CBD, I, I, I use some berberine. I use plants in like medicinal dosing of supplements or things I take to, to help my liver or whatever like that. Um, I might do an occasional tea. Not, not that often. In the last uh, six months or so, I've added in a few high fat um, fruits like avocado and olives. That's about it. I might have an occasional berry if my, in front with my son's eating something and I've made, you know, carnivore waffles and like, okay, I'm doing that for him. I might have a, a few. Well, I, I mean, chocolate as well. I do eat a little bit. I, I like dark chocolate. Yeah. Cause I ovulate and you know what I'm saying, ladies? You I know. know. <laughs> I'm like, I'm having some chocolate. Yeah, let's do it. Absolutely. So it's really interesting because I've never heard this before of having like predominantly meat. So are you saying that like every meal is just meat with nothing else? Yeah. Wow. 100% eggs, meat, I, animal. Animal, right. Okay. So I eat liver, trachea, thymus, kidneys, heart, steak. I, I primarily eat steak and hamburger. I like red meat. I eat a lot of red meat. I eat fish occasionally. I have salmon raw. I eat caviar all the time from omega threes. So I don't. I don't put people on omega three oil. I tell them to eat fish eggs because that's the best omega three DHA EPA in a phospholipid form that's going to cross your blood brain barrier. Those pills are rancid. Those things that are made in a factory from compressing fish. It's poison. I only do it if I have to, if I can't get a kid, you know, with autism to do it. You know what I mean? It's all, adults sound like, suck it up, buttercup. If you like it, great. If you don't, swallow them. Like, you know what I mean? I don't, I don't tolerate whining very well <laughs> with my patients. I can tell. <laughs> Who has time for that, right? You're coming to me. You're really sick. You're not doing well. I'm like, I can get you better, but I'm a can't, I cannot hold in your hand like a baby. Yeah. And if you're not okay with that, then keep feeling bad. Yeah. Oh, yes. That's what I eat. I eat a lot of eggs. Um, I have included dairy over the last few years, but in dairy is a, a tough topic. Some people can eat it. Some people can't. Mm -hmm. uh, unpasteurized raw would be the way to go. An A2 casein versus the what, what's available. People don't understand there's two different types of protein and they altered the cows to create this A1 nonsense and to make more. You, know, you got to look at people like these are not, this is an and the animal-based diet we're eating today is not what they were eating 40,000 years ago, right? A mammoth, a woolly mammoth, and, and the animals back then, to what we've done with what's available today, a little bit different, you know, but that's, I, oh, and a lot of bison, I eat a lot of bison. So I make myself eat, eat fish a little bit, sardines, anchovies to get bones. I eat a lot of collagen, I eat bone marrow. Um, yeah. So what I am observing, and I've always observed this from your videos, I am an avid follower on Instagram. You and I have had a few conversations on Instagram. You've just said you're 48. I mean, no one can take away whatever anyone believes. You look amazing. I mean, your skin is glowing. You, you don't seem to have any wrinkles. Your eyes are glowing. There must be something to be said about that because you do, you do look absolutely incredible. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. And I'll tell you, when I was a vegetarian for 14 years, I was uh, 50, 60 pounds heavier than this. My eyebrows had fallen out. My hair was gone. I was, you know, hypothyroid on, went into menopause in my thirties, had to be all oh, hormone replacement. Um, very, very constantly depressed, constantly suicidal. I mean, just didn't want to be here. Like I, I just, the world was the darkest, most miserable place. And being a vegan reinforces that, right? Because all you're seeing is suffering and cruelty. See? See the evidence, humans are horrible. I hate people. I just would rather be friends with my dog, right? It was a lot of that, a lot of not liking your own species in that culture. So <clears throat> I still have things I'm recovering from and dealing with because 14 years as a vegetarian from my 20s to my mid 30s was a devastating thing to do. You know, the brain isn't done developing to 25, 26 years old. And in my pivotal times of that, I was starving myself of all the saturated fat and cholesterol that I needed. It was a very, very bad decision. My mother kept telling me it was a bad decision, but of course I thought she didn't know what she was talking about because I believed the nonsense, I believed the hype, and I believed you know, the false science. So, but eventually you gotta wake up. I mean, eventually you gotta just start, you know, if, you, if, if I'm just one of those people who's willing to be wrong, and I'm like, wow, I really screwed that one up. But I'm like, well, I was 20, 20 years old. I mean, 20 year olds don't make good decisions. You don't have a good prefrontal cortex, you know? So to me, it's very important. 
you know, to keep guiding them. I, I treat patients that are under 25 as pediatric patients. And I tell them, I'm not to insult you, but you're only 21 to me. So you're not done yet. Mm-hmm. I got, you know, we have this many years because I come with a problem. Can you help me? Oh, absolutely. Your brain's not done. Like, you know, I got a lot of time to help make those connections and get these pathways because this isn't, you know, we were still going, right? So I, I did a lot of damage to myself. And I was playing, I was collegiate athlete and I broke my back. How many 19 year olds break their back in a soccer game, broke two ribs, had a concussion. It's because I created brittle bone disease on myself from not eating meat, mm-hmm. you know, and eating nothing, but you know, the vegetarian diet, most of the time it's a lot of gluten and a lot of soy. I mean, that's just the reality. Cause of course you want the tofurkey. Everyone's eating fake everything. Ooh, it's just like this. Ooh, look, it's tofu ice cream right? So there's a lot of that goes on high carbohydrate, high seed oils, high blood sugar leads to tons of insulin issues and insulin resistance. It's not healthy. And, you know, at the end of the day, the number one thing your body is trying to get is protein. It's trying to get nitrogen. The only place it's going to get that is from protein. And so you keep eating and eating and eating and eating other stuff. If you're not eating the protein, That's why people who have low protein diets always have way higher calorie diets than people who eat protein because we're satisfied satiety from the protein. That's the protein leverage hypothesis, but it it works every time, works every time. We'll be back to the episode really soon, but first a quick word from our sponsors. So regular listeners will know that I only affiliate with brands whose products I already use and trust. Integrity is one of my company's core values, and I feel really strongly about knowing that my listeners can be in full trust about any product I endorse. I personally contacted Block Blue Light UK after using their blue blocking glasses when I had to start working later into the evening. I began wearing the blue blockers because I was aware of what being exposed to the artificial blue light of my laptop would do to my circadian rhythm if I was working after dark and especially because we spend so much time on them during the day. After using them for a few months, there was a noticeable difference in how quickly I was able to fall asleep after finishing work not that long before. During the lockdowns and homeschooling my son, I also got him a kid's pair, and he now wears them anytime he's at a screen, not just after dark. And I feel really strongly about how important it is for both us and our children. Now, if you've never heard of blue light blocking, and this is the first time you're hearing it, Studies have shown that artificial blue light from screens, devices, and all modern lighting are having detrimental effects on our health. Artificial blue light disrupts our sleep, interferes with our hormones, and causes digital eye strain, which can lead to long-term eye health issues. Since using the glasses myself, and by the way, they do amazing fit-over glasses that fit seamlessly over any glasses you might already have to wear, which has been priceless for me because I have to wear my glasses when I'm at screen, I've noticed better sleep quality and an improvement in the thyroid issues I was struggling to balance out fully since having my kids. Bonus! Since Block Blue Light's sponsorship for last season, hundreds of you have made a decision to improve your health and your sleep by ordering their products. And I'm only hearing positive things, which was exactly my intention for this collaboration. So to check out all of Block Blue Light's incredible health boosting products, including day and nighttime glasses, blue light blocking light bulbs, and 100% light blocking sleep masks to help you into a deeper sleep, visit blockbluelight.co.uk UK and use the code Lauren10 for a 10% discount. That's blockbluelight.co.uk and use the code Lauren10. Thank you so much to Block Blue Light. So let's get on to what you do now because you just mentioned about your patients and about the brain. And obviously, you are a brain coach and you're into brain optimization. And you've had some amazing healing stories with your patients. So I'd love to hear more about what you do, how you treat people, what you treat, and the kind of stories you've, the kind of healing stories you've witnessed because of it. Sure. So, and honestly, I wouldn't, you know, been as good or gotten as uh, understanding it as much, the brain, until I had, until I got very sick myself and um, was forced to really look at the data and the science. And it just, once you look at it, you go, I can't believe I fell for this. I mean, the brain, I'm a human animal. A human is an animal, right? What am I made of? Animal protein, animal fat, and a bunch of minerals and structured compartmentalized bags of water. 
why in the world would anybody think you're supposed to make this out of lettuce and asparagus? They get why they think because they look at a gorilla or they look at a cow and they go, look at all that muscle. I'm like, then you go, oh man, do you understand the gastro uh, enterology field at all? Do you understand the gastrointestinal tract at all? And they don't. And ours is dramatically different than those animals. We have a completely different type of digestive tract and stomach situation and length. And, and they, they have special bacteria that we do not have that do something special to the grass, the leaves, and the sticks that they're eating. And we all know, well, we can't eat grass. We can't eat sticks. And uh -huh, they can. And they can eat all kinds of other plants. Why can they do it? Because those bacteria do the work for them. They're breaking it down and fermenting it in such a way that they turn it into medium chain fatty acids. That's what gets absorbed. So the cow and the gorilla are actually on a high fat, medium chain fatty acid ketogenic diet. That's how they're building all that muscle. Not from plants, it's from fat because they can do something. The bugs help them do that. But every single one of those species, by the way, also eats meat. And that's been proven. We've seen chimpanzees grow. They all eat meat when they when they have it. Squirrels eat it. People, oh, chickens. Chickens are carnivores. People don't want to. They want to think they eat corn. No, they don't. They, you know, throw throw meat at a chicken. Watch watch them go crazy. They eat bugs and meat and dead things. Right? They're carnivores. So, but we don't want to think that. So that being said, I had to look at guts because I started dealing with autism because my nephew was autistic. He got diagnosed when I was in graduate school. And I had to, you know, when you go down the autism route, you're going to lead to Dan Doctors and the GAPS diet by Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride. And you have to look at the gut brain connection more. You have to look at the parasympathetic sympathetic. So I just became more and more impressed and kind of obsessed with that. And you look at the brain and I'm like, uh, it's 70 to 80% animal fat, saturated fat, and of the 80% cholesterol. Every cell in the body makes cholesterol except red blood cells. They're kind of a weird cell. Um, hmm, that's interesting. Every cell membrane is cholesterol. Every hormone's made from cholesterol. Every, everything is cholesterol. So really when you go, all right, we have bones, minerals, all these minerals that you, you know where you get, oh, you know the best place to get minerals for your bones is? What do you think? The, the best place to get minerals for your bones. Your bones, like to have strong bones, right? Because our bones are minerals. Right. That gives us structure. Just where do you think is the best place? What, oh, you, you, I don't know. You're tricking me now. <laughs> I'm just going to let you give me the answer. Bones. You want to get minerals for bones? You eat bones. bones. That's called bone broth, bone marrow. This is what we learn to do. <laughs> okay. Right. You, you, it, it's, you want to get a healthy liver? You eat liver. Every indigenous tribe knows this. Every shaman knows this. Ayurvedic medicine uses it. Chinese medicine uses it. Like heals like. This is what we've been doing for thousands of years, if not a million years, okay? But the ancient texts of five, 6,000 years have laid it out. That, that, that's what's actually going on. So you're like, oh, how do I help a brain? I have to feed it what a brain is. I cannot change the structure and function of a human brain if it's starving, if it has no structure. So there's roughly seven to 10 pillars of things that make up brain performance. That's it. There's like 300 and some nutrients and micronutrients the body needs. I don't need to concern myself with all those. I need the seven to 10 things dialed in. But saturated fat and cholesterol are a huge part of that. And not shockingly, nature in her perfection and her divine wisdom makes food that has the saturated fat and cholesterol in it be already perfect with everything the brain needs. So you don't need to go search for the B vitamins and the copper and the zinc and, and the you know vitamin A that the brain needs because it's already in perfect proportion when you eat animals. The perfect and the, the proteins are complete. Plant proteins are called incomplete. They don't have all the amino acids you need, but animals do. They have choline. They have all of these brain things, cholesterol, that you cannot get in plants. So nature made it perfect. It's got the perfect amount of amino acids, perfect amount of cholesterol, perfect amount of choline, perfect amount of the vitamins that your body can use, and iron that's absorbable and actually bioavailable so people don't end up anemic because you can't get that from spinach. It's impossible. 
Just because you blend something in a blender and say, oh, look, there's iron in here and there's iron in here. That doesn't mean your body can absorb it and use it. Not the same thing. So that's the trickery they do though. Blend something in a blender. That's what they do to tell you what's in something. And as if that's the same as if when you eat it and it gets absorbed and used, it's not the same. It's just, it's not even remotely the same. So I start with uh, foundations of rebuilding them. And I made a decision about three, four years ago. I no longer will accept vegans unless they're willing to change because I can't, I'm not wasting their time or money. And because what I do, that would be like me training an anorexic for a marathon. So neurofeedback is I read uh, brainwave activities uh, called e QEEG, and I'm looking at elect electrical brainwaves, uh, delta, theta, alpha, beta, gamma, and I'm looking at uh, parts of the brain that are active, overactive, underactive, right? Waking things up, quieting things down, creating highways and networks again so the brain can talk to itself better. I basically hold a mirror up to the brain and I say, this is what you're doing. And it's able to self-correct how it's putting on its own lipstick. And putting on its lipstick might be how to sleep, how to calm down, how to meditate, how to focus in class, right? How not to have panics, how not to have a seizure, right? Those are the things that we train the brain to do with neurofeedback. I cannot ask a brain to do that. It, it's like CrossFit, you know, two, three times a week. How dare I do that to a starved, anorexic, malnourished brain? I cannot. So I do start with food. Uh, I also start with light. Light is a nutrient. So the lack of light, like lack of sunlight, and the exposure to too many toxic lights, it's a huge thing. Sound is also a nutrient. I use sound in different sound therapy and avoiding certain sounds because that's nutrition. I look at nutrition, what's coming into the system. That's food, light, sound, magnetism. I deal with magnets. The earth is giving off magnetic pulses. People aren't connected to it anymore. So they're, they're starving from magnetic field penetration, but they're poisoned by the magnetic fields coming off their phone. And their, and their computers, right? So that's a, a big part of what I do. So I deal with changing the way people hear things with sound therapies. I deal with bone conduction therapies. I deal with uh, electrical stimulation across the brain or into the body, um, uh, neurofeedback, biofeedback, a whole bunch of things. And so I typically ADHD, autism, PTSD, uh, suicidal ideation, seizures, stroke, traumatic brain injury, things like that are, are my wheelhouse. Well, wow. so what, um, so say a child with autism comes to you, what is your um, plan of action with them and how, how is it working? How does it actually work? Okay, well, autism, you pick a big one. Uh, that is, we have a saying, um, my mentor who trained me in neurofeedback, Dr. Richard Souter, psychologist here in Atlanta, he said, well, we have a saying, you know, in autism, if you've seen one autistic brain, you've seen one autistic brain. That's it, because they're so unique and so different. Yes, there are patterns and phenotypes and there are things that are very similar that we have to be aware of, but each case is incredibly unique. So we're gonna do a lot of testing, a lot of cognitive performance testing, do brain imaging, do testing of sound, how sound is going into the ears, auditory processing, things like that. Uh, gut testing, um, brain chemical neurotransmitters and definitely methylation. So these are, you gotta see the picture before you start, right? And then you look at what the family's doing and where are they? Where, where is this kid? Is this kid, you know, high functioning or are we nonverbal and smearing feces on the wall, right? It, where we start and what we do all depend uh, upon that. So I will tell you a story then about one, one little girl that, is one of my favorites. Um, and this family, Lauren, Lauren is a little girl. Her mom and dad came and, um, and I'm very blessed because the majority of time with my patients, I have both parents show up and that's not very common in the autism community. Divorce rates are through the roof. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a lot of, of one spouse can't handle it right? It's very, very stressful. It's a very, very hard thing for families to deal with. Like people want to always see the feel good story on the news about the kid who made the basket. That's great, but that's not the majority of what goes on. You know, this is a very, very hard, complex uh, family systems thing to address. So I'm very blessed to have that. And, and I know that's part of my success is the integrity of these families and support that 
usually the mothers are also getting from a, a husband or wife, right? She's not abandoned or alone or fighting against something, hiding it, which is very common to also have to lie. Mothers are literally lying and going to holistic practitioners to get help under the radar of not telling their husband, which is tragic. So that being said, you came, the mom is a PhD psychologist. She's a school psychologist. I forget what the, oh, dad was retired military. That's right. He was honorably discharged injury. I remember, God, I love this family. Yeah, he had a limp. He was injured. So he was kind of the full-time stay-at-home caregiver. Mom was a school psychologist. They'd done everything. Lauren was maybe seven or eight. Spoke about 20 words, I think. Um, very well behaved, um, you know, but would have her stimming kind of fits and it's ex ex difficult, but 20 words, right? So lots of stress and anxiety, just getting her dressed for school. So she was in a public school that her mom actually worked at, was a school psychologist and was considered one of the best, you know, autism schools around special programs, that kind of a thing, not mainstreamed. They went through the story. Of course, it was a vaccine injury. I said, but do we know what happened? And they were like, oh, and that dad told that chilling story, you know, with, with the combination of tears and rage in his eyes. Because I remember the, the exact moment. I can tell you exactly what happened. So, mm -hmm. so again, I've heard that a thousand times. So anybody trying to say that's not true, I mean, unless you've been in practice and seen this, you should shut your mouth, right? I, I don't have a lot of respect for people with opinions that have never done it. It's disrespectful to those families and these children. Um, so it tells her, I'm like, okay. And I kind of don't remember exactly what it is they were coming for, right? Like what, it, I think maybe it might've just been to help her. We want to make her, her life as best as we can. Like whatever, I, I don't remember, right? A few years ago. But mom was very bold and I loved it. She goes, here's the thing. I'm here, but I think this is nonsense. But my husband really wants to do this. But we've tried everything. We've done this, oh, this didn't work, that didn't work, this didn't work, that didn't work. So I'm real skeptical of all this, whatever you're saying, but I'm willing to try it. Okay, you know, Candace, I love her. I was like, okay, as long as you're, I'm open. But like, I'm gonna say, I'm, I'm the skeptical one. He's all in, but you're gonna have to prove it. Okay. I, I, I don't remember some point we were open six, seven days a week. I would work on Saturdays because of children need to come in three times a week. So we really want to make this as easy as possible for families. Um, and I would rotate my Saturdays with my staff and I was in there on a Saturday and they came in and I did all the QEGs. We did all the stuff. They were already on point with the diet. They were pretty good. Most people in the autism community already are at least gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free. That's a bare minimum. These children cannot eat these foods. If you're listening to this and you don't already know this, I don't care if your pediatrician doesn't understand this or they say it doesn't matter, they're wrong. The most important book a family with autism can get is The GAPS Diet, Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, the Russians in that whole area, they figured this out. They've been using carnivore for a very long time to heal mental illnesses, by the way. So, you know, that is a foundational place I get people to. So I think I upgraded them a little bit, added a few things, did a little bit of a nuance. I adjusted her. She didn't even adjust. I'm a chiropractor. So I did start actually hands-on helping her once a week, changing her nervous system that way. Um, but I didn't need to do a ton. I added a few higher nutrients. I did a little bit of fermented vegetables. I did get, you know, a little bit more bone, brought a little bit of things, tweaked away a little bit of sugar, got rid of a little bit of convenient foods, taught them to get a crock pot, did some basics. Like, yeah, you guys, that's good. And they, okay. They're like, yeah, I need you to remind me. I'm like, okay. And we just did neurofeedback. And she played computer games, basically with her brain. And we slowly watched and tracked the words and they just got more and more and more. And we eventually got to the point like, okay, Lauren, you've got to come back here. If you want that video, I need to hear you say the words. And she would start with things like kitty cat, kitty cat, kitty cat. And she would repeat, she would stem echolalia. And just say that, I'm like, and eventually got to the point, it would say, okay, no, how would you ask for that? I want the kitty cat video. It went from repeating kitty cat 150 times to I want the kitty cat video. The wow. mom and dad would come in and, and told the story, like just about like, again, being able to put on shoes and a shirt and brush her teeth and come down ready to breakfast when they watched it one day without them saying anything. Like if you're not a parent that doesn't go through this, you don't understand what just happened. Mm -hmm. And they would have constant things like her words. Like, I mean, she has, you know, was years later, I came to speak to their school. She's hundreds, thousands. I'm like, oh my gosh. It's like, they actually have her in. Now she's still autistic right? 
She's in a mainstream class though with an eight. That's an extremely different case. And I remember one Saturday, you know, I, I you have to put these electrodes in. I just pointed again, it's a podcast, but you you put little paste and electrodes on their brain in certain spots. And so they sit in a chair and you know, I often you're behind people, but sometimes you got to be in front of the kids. You don't want you creating safety and then you know where I am. And autistic kids often don't want to be touched, but you know, they're not contact and touching the a lot of sensory tactile issues. And I was putting it on, I forget, I kneeled down in front of her in the chair and I'm like, okay, now, now it's time for you to, you know, you're gonna have to tell me what videos and you're gonna, you're gonna pick them, right? And, and she just goes, yes, I can. And she put her little hands on my cheeks and she just pulled me in and kissed me on the lips and, and just smiled and then got up and walked to my desk and started clicking through the videos she wanted. And I mean, her mom and I just looked at each other I looked, and we're just both bawling. And I was like, this is why I come in here on a Saturday. I'm like, you've just made my year. And then the mom told me some other stories and she's crying every time they just come and tell you a story. And you're like, going from a girl that couldn't look me in the eyes, who couldn't be touched, who didn't, he had 20 words to, you know, grabbing me and kissing me and hugging me and saying full sentences and mainstreamed in a class. And that only took 30 or 40, maybe 50 neurofeedback sessions. I mean, it, it was four months of their life to come into my office three times a week. Four months. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, who knows it, that kind of brain could be doing neurofeedback for the rest of her life. But I mean, we have to look at, we can't medicalize these children as well. They need breaks. We always say, oh no, take a break. And then she would, she would come say, come back for 10 sessions. You know, that's going to be permanent. What we did is permanent. Keep doing home exercises, keep doing stuff, get her off, not, not much TV screens because the screens and the TV are ruining these kids' brains and they're changing what we're doing. So I'm training her brain to focus, but watching a TV screen trains your brain to go into slow theta waves. It trains it to be distracted. It trains it to go comatose. Mm -hmm. So these are the things I have to teach them. So I do change behaviors and lifestyle that way. Mm -hmm. um, but th there's tons of those, tons of, you know, it, it, it might not seem like a big deal to a neurotypical kid, family, mom or dad, but a nine-year-old boy after training, being able to ride a bike for the first time in his life, mm -hmm. being able to throw a ball and catch a ball with me in the park. I teach kids to ride bikes sometimes to throw and catch a ball and the pride and joy that they have that they can do these things now. And that that had to be done to help their lisp go away to help them be able to spell, you know, to help them, the brain now left and right sides can communicate with each other and being able to tie your shoes and throw a ball and skip, show me that, that you can do that now. So it's all a part of it. I have to do all of those things, believe it or not. Um, and yes, I've gone in the parking lot and thrown balls with kids to assess where they are in the beginning and then show them their parents where they are at the end mm -hmm. and made them be able to ride bikes by doing brain therapies. It's amazing because it sounds like it, it's so nuanced. There's so much to it. And I think this is often what we miss in kind of the uh, conventional medical model that it's kind of like a one size fits all and there's just one approach and you kind of just, you know, treat the brain or uh, like I always say, you know, you've got a stomach problem, you go to a gastroenterologist, you've got a heart problem, you go to a cardiologist and you're not kind of uh, conflating any of them together and, 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 and seeing the body as one whole moving vehicle where it sounds like what you're doing is so many different things that parents coming to you in that situation would probably not have thought of most of those things and why they're needed. Yeah, people don't, they're not, they're not teaching it right. I mean, you know, it was, it was Andrew Wakefield, the gastroenterologist who made them out of the UK, who made the yep. massive gut connection. He's like, I'm not an autism doctor. Right. I don't even know anything about it. But he saw what was happening in the gut and said, this pathology is significant. Well, of course, the gut, the vagus nerve and the way the enteric communication is back and forth in the brain and what those two do, they're talking to each other and informing each other all the time. Inflammation in one place causes inflammation in the other, stress in one is stress in the other, back and forth. And so he knew what he was onto. And, you know, I'm a huge fan. And the fact that they decided him will tell you, like, look at the system, look at what the system doesn't want you to know. They don't also teach people, pediatricians don't know that you learn to read with your ears. They don't understand that. 
So people diagnose a kid with ADHD or dyslexia without looking at the ears. 40% of those cases are misdiagnosed and it's an auditory processing disorder of some sort. You treat the ears and the hearing and the reading problem goes away. But you can't do that if you're not taught it. And you certainly can't do it if you're lazy. Mm. You cannot do that in seven minutes and pay a copay of $15 with your insurance. It's impossible. If they can come up with that device, more power to them. That's Star Trek world. I would love to see that world happen, but... For now, it takes me hours upon hours upon hours upon hours with a kid to make that happen. Yeah. And parents got to do it at home too. The parents have homework to do with these kids too. It can't stop, yeah. right? I think that's the key, isn't it? And I think I've always seen that with my own health and with, with people that I work with is that it's just not an easy fix. Nothing worth doing or nothing that, you know, gets long-term results is ever an easy fix. You've got to, it gets uncomfortable. It's not easy. Um, but What's easy? It's easy to not get sick. Right. But this is what I always say as well. Like it, it, people go, oh, it's such hard work. What are you doing? And it was way harder being in a wheelchair. <laughs> that was way harder work, you know, like not being able to live, not being able to work, not being able to like, you know, go out with my friends or meet someone or, you know, and you know, it's way easier now to be married and have kids and run a business. I'll tell you, if I take you away, if I took you and your family and you lived with the Hudza tribe in Africa for a year, your life would be, it would be easy for you. You wouldn't be carting around a bunch of supplements. You wouldn't be going doing a bunch of therapies. You're not working anymore. You're not running a business. You're not tied into a centralized government, a centralized financial system that's a lie. So you were bought into things that are not connected to nature. Yeah. It's all fake. And we think it's real. What's hard is living disconnected from nature. Yeah. But we've become addicted to technology and comfort and institutions and centralized money, the fiat system, and education, these big bureaucratic things. We think that's normal. That's what makes you sick. Mm -hmm. so if, you, if we just took you off and let you live the way you're supposed to live, your body would heal yeah. faster and faster and faster and faster. I mean, there's, they don't even live electricity. Yeah. I mean, just look at the, the lack of poisoning in so many ways that you would be exposed to. I mean, that's it. They're not stressed about food. They have abundant everything. And when they come across berries and honey, they eat it, you know, but you would get used to eating things you've never eaten before. You would be drinking blood. That would seem weird at first. Your, your whole mind would have to be like, uh, what's going on here? But once you get over it, you it, it, your life wouldn't be, it, it's, it would be very easy. It's effortless for them to stay healthy. They don't even have words for depression and anxiety because nobody has it. Yeah. They don't have religion there. They don't believe in an afterlife. No one's depressed. No one's anxious. No one has PTSD. No one's suicidal. They're always happy. To them, that's, that's the natural state. Yeah. And without a phone, without a TV, without electricity, sleeping on the ground, plenty of food. There's, there's the idea that, that there's a scarcity food issue is ridiculous. That's a lie. You, know, you see what I'm saying? That you have to really rethink everything you've been taught. You can't say some of what you've been taught is, is BS. You got to say, maybe it all is. I've got to rethink everything. Well, maybe. I'm always open to that because the more I go on, the more I learn and, and the more I see kind of everything, you know. Do you know about them? No. Oh, yeah. Look at the Hadza. I will. I mean, it, it's <laughs> everything you're, you know, there's, there's just, you've given me a lot of food for thought and I know that my listeners are going to feel the same as well. And it's just been, fascinating talking to you like I said I do enjoy following your posts as well so yeah we've definitely got a lot of food for thought the moral of this for me what I've come down to you can tell me if this is right kind of what all this just packs into is we have to get closer to nature yes go out in it and bring it into your house more right yep as much as possible yeah that just kind of always seems to be what what uh, you know the message that I'm always led back to that just seems kind of counterintuitive not to and just seems kind of, it's just logical so yeah. and the human ego and the egoic mind wants you to think some study from a lab funded mm -hmm. by probably funded by big pharma <laughs> under blue toxic lights done on some rats with some isolated dead cells in a petri dish right gonna tell you anything about what it means to be human yeah go outside nature will tell you real quick yeah Nature's laws cannot be broken because she will break you. You best respect which, what the temperature, you know, and that's why, you know, cold therapy and sauna therapy, all this stuff. 
People avoid sweating now to a point they're poisoning themselves because they can't detoxify. We slather ourselves with carcinogenic chemicals. We put in fake breasts full of silicone. I mean, think of the, look at the things we do to ourselves that are normal. Botox, we style in. I mean, just th this is like the way we live and we think, what, I eat healthy because you eat a bunch of stuff that says keto steps, you know, stamped on it and that or, or vegan in its little plastic wrapper that came from some factory with a bunch of chemicals from some food scientist. What part of that is good for you, right? That's, and, and we've just become so, so disconnected that we're the only, only animal on earth that has 47 books sitting on their desk about what to eat and still doesn't know what to do. And we think we're so smart and a lion and a hippo and a snake and even a cockroach looks at us and goes, what kind of morons are these that they don't even know how to eat? Yeah, we just don't listen to our intuition. We've created so much nonsense with our big brains that we forgot simple things like how to sleep, how to eat, how to have babies, how to breastfeed. Very basic. We're, 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 we got, there's only so many things we need to do. My kids taught me to forget how to sleep. So I'm going to blame them for that. <laughs> kids have a superpower, right? Oh, they really do. But thank you so much. This has been amazing. So we just end with my little segment called All About You, the five quick fire questions. I mean, I think we've got to know you quite well here, but this just is my little way of helping the listeners get to know the guests. So first one I always start with is wellness is fill in the blank. Oh, gosh, that's a weird one. Wellness is it's weird. The first thing that pops in my head is wellness is love. Okay, well, there we go. You're the first person that's ever said that's weird. <laughs> I know, isn't that weird? In fact, you're the first person who said a lot of things to me today, but that's okay. <laughs> um, if you could pass a law that everyone had to follow, what would it be? Oh, wow. These are good. So um, not weird? Just, <laughs> it's actually good. good one. Wow, that's a lot. Oof, wow. I would probably say you know, something about like learning to love yourself through quiet meditation or something. And I, I wouldn't want to tell them how to do it. So probably, I don't know how you could pass a law to make sure people could love themselves and not speak so negatively to themselves, but something like that. That's a nice one. Definitely needed. I think you'll like this one. If you could raid one person's brain and retain all the information, who would it be? Wait, I could do what? To that? You could raid one person's oh. brain. Wow. All right. <laughs> I would probably go with Thoth. Who's that? He's an Atlantean god, supposedly, who wrote the Emerald Tablets 36,000 years ago. You are definitely the first person who said that. Okay. <laughs> um, what attracts you to people? Oh, man. You know, energy. I mean, you know, good energy. I mean, ener you know, energy is real. You can feel it. You can tell who's the magnetism is going to draw you in. But if I had to say personalities, I do like, I like strong personalities. I like courage. I like fighters. I like an underdog. I like people who don't give up. So kind, loving, you know, that, that's always good. I don't really love a whiner. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't have a lot of, I don't have a lot of tolerance for it. You did mention the Gaps Diet book before, but I'm wondering if that's it. The last one is a book that changed your life. Oh, wow. I mean, I am a book nut. I mean, I have a problem. At I've had to stop myself at times. Me too. Like, I can't keep buying like the amount of money. And my son has had yeah, the same problem. Like he just, and we never want to get rid of him. And, um, book that changed my life. God, there's so, so many. <sighs> One of different times I've done different things. The Mutant Message from Down Under. That's incredible about a woman's journey into the Aboriginal out and out a back experience, meet message was powerful for me. Oh, I'm going to like not say all the ones. There's just... Just the, the, the one that changed your book the most, just the one. Oh, Can we go with the mutant message? I, mean, I wouldn't say that's the biggest one by any means. It's the first one that popped up. And I think because I talked about some of these tribal uh, cultures and nature and experience, and they were really, they're, they may be one of the last true human being tribes left on earth and we're destroying them. They're almost died out. It's unfortunate. We're, we're, we've gone in and just taken over their land and they can't do what they're supposed to do, but they're highly psychic and connected and knowing things. Gosh, you know, I'm, I'm really not. Do you know what? We can, if, if another, well, a good one, primal body, primal mind, 
Nora Gedaudis. That book probably describes what I do and practice the most. She's a neurofeedback therapist and nutrition okay. is very similar to me. That's a great book. But there's so many. There's Thank like you, so many on that. Rumi, Rumi, a poem, a book of his was like potent. These love poems. Like I read those every day for a while. So books are like really important to me. I, I typically, before I became a mother, I read five to seven books a week. Wow. Yeah. So I'm saying like to say that I'd have to go to my book. Oh, right. This one, this one, this one. Yeah, yeah. Um, and depending on what, you know, thing, a Deepak book that I read on the beach of Costa Rica was actually really powerful. I mean, it's a little yeah. bit of a out now to me, but this book was like, wow. Meta Human's really good though. Which one was it? Meta Human, his most recent one. I didn't read, eh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a Deepak fan anymore. <laughs> okay. But well, I, said- if you watch some of what he's, I think there's a little bit of whatever. I mean, unfortunately, but he was powerful to me back in the past. Yeah. Um, one of his books was really good. God, I'm sorry, I can't think of any. No, like, those were, you've given me three. The, those are brilliant. But anyway, I'm conscious that we've, I've taken up too much of your time already. But um, thank you so much for being here. We're going to link all your details in the show notes, but just uh, quickly tell people where they can follow you, where they can look you up. Sure, yeah, just Dr. Rimka, drrimka.com, D-R-R-I-M-K-A. I'm the only one in the world, an incredibly rare name. Um, that'll take you to my main site. And then I have a e-learning center that if you click the courses button, I'll take you there. And I also run retreats. The next retreat I have coming up is a safari, a wilderness safari in South Africa, wow. 2022, where we will be, it's an echo safari. So we're connected to nature, but I give you beds. You know, we got beds, <laughs> you have a toilet, you have a shower, but there's no electricity. Wow. Okay. It's open air, open tent in a wild, I mean, there will be elephants and things will come through camp. You know, we have armed guards protecting us, right? You know, we have, we rangers will be there in case, but you know, it, it all safe. South Africans know how to do safari and it's going to be at the Karangwe camp conservation preserve, but we will see all the things, the lions and the cheetahs and the giraffes and everything, private chefs, everything handled. So I do that as well. Again, I have an e-learning center and I do take clients. So Dr. Rimka on Instagram, Dr. Rimka's Brand Body Solution. That's the name of my practice. I'm on Facebook. I do a lot on Instagram and, and Facebook free. I also have a YouTube, Dr. Rimka. I'm trying to build that up. It's a little bit tricky. You know, like it's so hard to do all the things, right? Yeah, you can't do all of it. Yeah, it takes too much time. I the videos there. So I do a lot of free content, but I also have e-learning courses, visualization, you know, women, a whole woman's journey, some co-ed courses, like a sleep course, an immune course. You can just pick these up real fast, go through them in seven to 20 days or so, and tons of videos and posts and education and, and kind of breaking up some of the lies and myths. Often the courses, I can say things that I can't say on the regular feed, um, but my 3R and my M1 courses are like in the weight loss course. They're live with me. People have lives. You can do Q&A that way. You can do Zooms with me. It's a very affordable way to access me versus paying for one-on-one care. Some people need that, but this is a way in a group format, you can get me for a fraction. You know, the, the cost of one of my courses is less than I cost per hour. You know what I mean? So it's it's a nice way to do it. Amazing. Awesome. Well, we'll definitely be sure to look that up. Thank you so much for being here. I have a lot to be uh, getting on with now and thinking about. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. This season of Reconditioned is sponsored by Block Blue Light, the world's leading supplier of blue and artificial light blocking products, including blue light glasses and blue blocking lighting solutions. Blue light blocking products aim to alleviate digital eye strain, improve sleep, and optimize health through mitigating the harmful effects of artificial light from screens and modern lighting. For a 10% discount across the range, visit blockbluelight.co.uk and enter the code LAUREN10. Thank you to Block Blue Light. Thank you so much for choosing to listen to Recondition today. I'd be so grateful if you could subscribe and maybe even leave a review if you enjoyed this episode. And better still, if you could share with friends and family who could benefit from the content, that's what I'd really love. I just want us to share the love so that everyone can understand how to use an integrative approach to life and health. For more free resources, visit laurenvacneen.co.uk and laurenvacneencoaching.com.